Good morning and welcome back to UCI Minds monthly Facebook Live series, Ask the Doc, Alzheimer's Research Today. I'm Chelsea Cox, Associate Director of Education for UCI Mind, which is one of 32 congressionally designated Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country and the only center right here in Orange County, California. Um, this series is our, what we're aiming to do is bring our experts to you to discuss the latest advances in Alzheimer's disease and dementia research and brain health. Um, and at UCI Mind, we're a collection over, of over 100 faculty, staff, and trainees who've really dedicated their lives to better understanding Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Now, this is the final episode of our 2019 series. And today we are going to discuss the unique link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease with Dr. Ira Lott, Professor, Professor Emeritus of Neurology and Pediatrics at UC Irvine. Welcome, Dr. Lott. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining me today. Before we get started with q and I just would like to introduce Dr. Lott to all of you. Um, Dr. Lott completed his medical degree at Ohio State University, followed by training in pediatrics, neurology, and child neurology at Harvard. He is a widely respected child neurologist at UCI and Chalk Children's Hospital, having received a Best Doctors in America, de in America designation for 25 years. Dr. Lott is an integral member of UCI Mind, leading the Down Syndrome program, which studies brain aging Alzheimer's disease and dementia in individuals with Down Syndrome. His program has been supported by the NIH, the Alzheimer's Association, and the state of California, including the largest clinical research grant for Down syndrome in NIH history. Dr. Lott has received multiple national awards for his research and has been commended by the California State Senate for his leading work on behalf of individ individuals with intellectual disabilities. So truly an honor, Dr. Lott, to have you with us today. Thank you for your time. Um, and to all of you who are attending live right now, if this is your first time to our Facebook Live series, the way that it works is I'll get things started by asking Dr. Lott a few questions. And then please, as you have questions that come up, you can go ahead and type them there in the comments box um, for, at this Facebook video. And Dr. Lott will try to answer as many questions as he has time for. Please do remember that whatever you post in the comments box will be linked to your name and visible to others. So please, of course, as always, post responsibly. So let's go ahead and get started. And um, Dr. Lott, I just wanted to start um, by asking you if you could tell us a little bit more about Down syndrome in general. What exactly is Down syndrome and how is it diagnosed? Down syndrome is the most uh, common genetic form of intellectual disability. Uh, to put this in context, we have to go back a bit in history. In 1866, a physician by the name of Langdon Downs discovered that people with what is now called Down syndrome had a certain number of physical characteristics, and they looked much more like each other than people in a typical population. So Langdon Downs was the first to define what today we call the phenotype. And he was astonishingly accurate in pointing out these traits. Mm -hmm. Second milestone was in 1960, and it was the discovery of the chromosome abnormality in Down syndrome. Everybody with Down syndrome has an extra 21st chromosome. And it is ubiquitous throughout the world Sometimes it's a small piece, sometimes it's a larger piece that's um, triplicated. The other name for Down syndrome is trisomy 21. The third milestone was the discovery of a mouse model for Down syndrome, and that was in the early 1990s. And uh, it turns out that the 16th chromosome on the mouse has the same genes as the 21st in the human. So there have been thousands of papers now studying the behavior, the neuroanatomy, the neurobiology of the mouse model, and has contributed to our understanding of people with Down syndrome. Okay. And how is Down syndrome diagnosed? <clears throat> it's diagnosed on the basis of physical characteristics. Uh, 
which are reasonably common uh, between one person with Down syndrome and another person. It's interesting that none of these characteristics are specific to Down syndrome. They're all seen in the general population. Mm -hmm. It's just together uh, they form what we call the phenotype. And of course, the other way to diagnose, uh, the mandatory way is through chromosomal testing. Okay. Now, today we're here to talk about the, the unique link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Why are people with Down syndrome at an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease? So this goes back a little bit in history as well. Uh, in the late 1940s, a physician working for the city of New York as a neuropathologist published a short paper uh, in which he had carried out an autopsy examination of the brain in three individuals with Down syndrome, two in their 50s and one in their late 40s. And these brains all showed the changes of Alzheimer's disease, even though the people were not very old. So over the next decades, really, by 1970, <clears throat> it was determined that 100% of people with Down syndrome have changes in their brain of Alzheimer's by the time they're age 40 years. Now, that doesn't mean they all develop dementia, but they all have the neuropathologic changes of Alzheimer's, which has been referred to on some of these earlier programs, so-called amyloid plaques and tangles. And so it's this curious relationship between people having the pathology who may or may not have the clinical picture of dementia and why some get demented and others do not has been a major focus of our research. Now we know one of the culprits here is a gene that is on the 21st chromosome. And that gene makes amyloid, which is one of the chemicals responsible for Alzheimer's disease. That is called amyloid and the gene is called amyloid precursor protein, or APP. Virtually everyone with Down syndrome has three copies of APP instead of two. And so we think this is a necessary <clears throat> part of the picture. Uh, one of the reasons we know this is a case that uh, was worked on by uh, our senior research coordinator, Eric Duran, a number of years ago a very high functioning gentleman with Down syndrome who came to our clinic at the age of 66. And it turns out that he is a rare individual, once in a lifetime uh, individual who has two copies of APP and not three. And for all the world, he looked otherwise like a classical person with Down syndrome. So in following him over the course of seven years, he developed no dementia. He had no amyloid uptake in his brain. And we were privileged to do a post-mortem examination and he had no findings for Alzheimer's disease. So as a result of this case, I think we can say pretty conclusively that amyloid is necessary for the production of Alzheimer's in Down syndrome, but it's not sufficient. There are other factors at work, and uh, that's a focus of our current research. Okay, so you did mention, I just wanted to repeat this, that um, the Alzheimer's disease pathology is in the brain of 100% of people with uh, Down syndrome by the age of about 40. 40 years, yes. Okay. Um, so, and when we're saying that, we mean pathology in the brain, amyloid plaques, and neurofibrillary tangles, but this does not necessarily result in clinical symptoms of dementia. Yes, the dementia symptoms increase with age, mm -hmm. but at no time is it 100%. Mm -hmm. So why do some develop dementia and others do not? This is very important for people with Down syndrome 
it's also a very important question for Alzheimer's in the general population. Yeah, and really the crux of much of your research. And so what are some of your theories about why that is? We are uh, looking at other contributors to uh, the onset of dementia. And this may have to do with things like inflammation of the brain. It may have to do with processes that are called oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. There's a whole list of possible contributing factors. One of the things that uh, we have found and others around the world have found is people with Down syndrome uh, often do not have very good dental hygiene. So they have a high incidence of periodontitis, which is inflammation of the gums. We are concerned that this chronic inflammation, like periodontitis, might be a trigger for dementia later in life. So our current research is focusing on identifying what are called biomarkers uh, that may uh, herald the change to dementia. Uh, and we're looking at brain imaging, we're looking at blood and spinal fluid, metabolic products, uh, we're looking at PET scanning, uh, we're looking at a variety of neuropsychological tests, all of this done in a longitudinal manner. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a consortium of six centers uh, around the country, one of them in the UK, uh, that are collecting harmonized data. So the purpose of this is try to identify a uh, series of markers that predict the change to dementia at a time when intervention may prove useful. Mm -hmm. We and others have found if you wait until the dementia process starts in Down syndrome, the outcome is not very good. And that's because people with Down syndrome have a baseline intellectual disability. So their brain reserve to fight a condition like Alzheimer's may not be as well developed as say a college professor or someone else. Mm -hmm. So this early identification of who is at most risk uh, with the idea of a therapeutic trial. And the other thing I would say is this process of amyloid deposition in the brain starts in childhood in Down syndrome. In fact, there have been fetuses and newborn infants with Down syndrome who passed away due to a unrelated cause who are seen to have very early amyloid plaques. These plaques don't appear pathological till age 40, but it's not real healthy for the neurons to carry this amyloid around. Now, what this means to me as a pediatric neurologist, if we find something that is safe and, safe and efficacious for adults with Down syndrome, we can step back to earlier age epochs and treat people at a much younger age. Mm. And that opportunity is afforded in the Alzheimer field only with people who have Down syndrome. So I think one can sense the importance of this not only for people with Down syndrome, which is our primary aim, but for Alzheimer's in the general community. Um, now, how is uh, de Alzheimer's dementia diagnosed in individuals with Down syndrome, and are there unique challenges to diagnosis? So 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the field will have said, you can't diagnose dementia and Down syndrome because everyone has an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. It's too confusing. And that uh, misperception was one of the reasons the field was held back for so many years. You know, in fact, the people who know the most about Down syndrome are pediatricians, and they don't know a lot about Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And the Alzheimer researchers don't know a lot about Down syndrome. So our job here at UCI Mind has been making this link 
uh, between development and aging. So there are now a number of ways in which a consensus can be reached about changes to dementia. It requires a battery of tests that are similar in many ways to the battery used in general Alzheimer's, but there are specific tests, of course, for people with Down syndrome because of the uh, intellectual disability. Okay. Um, now, I've noticed a few more people trickled in and are attending live. Thanks for joining us today. Um, if this is your first time joining us, that you can go ahead and actually type questions into the comments box if you have any questions for Dr. Lott, and he will be happy to answer them. Um, so, Dr. Lott, we just talked about diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia in Down syndrome. Why do you think that it's uh, important for people with Down syndrome and their families to be aware of the increased risk for Alzheimer's disease? And are families generally aware of this increased risk, or is there a need to increase education of this? I'd say the major reason mm -hmm. to uh, have families aware of the risk is the potential therapies that are in the pipeline for Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at the activities of UCI Mind and other centers, there are a number of drugs, non-pharmacologic therapies uh, that are being worked on. And people with Down syndrome are now eligible to receive those therapies if they have a diagnosis properly made. When you make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, dementia, people with Down syndrome, you have to exclude a whole host of other medical factors that may mimic dementia, but are not dementia. For example, people with Down syndrome have a high incidence of thyroid dysfunction. And uh, thyroid dysfunction can mask as dementia, but it's treated separately. Likewise, hearing deficits, visual deficits, general systemic illnesses, all that has to be eliminated. And that's part of what we call the differential uh, diagnosis. So the first reason the families need to know about this is that Down syndrome is going to be able to share in the therapeutic trials that are coming down the line. The second is uh, family planning so that one can anticipate changes and make proper accommodations uh, for this. You ask me, do most families know about this risk? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's variable. Uh, the most active part of um, <clears throat> Down syndrome organizations, such as uh, the Down syndrome Association of Orange County, which is extremely active grassroots organization. Most of these families are younger families with children, adolescents, and young adults. So some of the older parents who are considerably older than the people with Down syndrome may not know of this risk. And so uh, continuing education is a big target for us. Yeah. Um, and we do partner with Down Syndrome Association of Orange County, yep. um, Regional Center of Orange County, and Alzheimer's Orange County to bring education to um, the community of Down Syndrome individuals and their families to raise awareness of this type of risk. Because like you said, it's incredibly important for families to be aware um, for several reasons, including family planning, as well as um, to be aware of research that's happening and potential therapies that could be coming down the pipeline. And um, kind of on that note, you had talked a little bit about the research that you're doing uh, in biomarker um, identification in people with Down syndrome. What other types of studies are going on in Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease? Are there clinical trials and things that are happening? Um, what's, what's, tell us a little bit more about that. So the other mm -hmm. focus of our research, and we have two grants in, in this regard, is to uh, organize a cohort ready population for clinical trials. So if you look at this problem in Alzheimer's from uh, the standpoint of big pharma, 
the people who are developing the next generation of drugs, uh, pharmacologic agents for Alzheimer's, if they're going to approve a therapeutic trial, they want to know that you have a cohort of people who have been properly tested, properly screened, and uh, will be properly followed uh, before they make an investment in a trial for Down syndrome. And uh, that's one of our other big targets to organize these clinical trial-ready cohorts. How can people find out about how to get involved in that? The information in regard to all of our research is on the UCI Mind okay. website. And uh, we may be developing a Facebook website ourselves, but our major link is through UCI Mind. We've been part of UCI's UCI Minds research for over 25 years. And we're, I think, still the only major memory institute in the world that has a robust and sustained interest in Down syndrome. Um. Yes, and speaking of Down syndrome research, I I also just wanted to ask um, Dr. Lott, and I know you've been a, an incredible advocate in this, but how are the rights of people with Down syndrome protected and taken into account in participating in things like clinical trials and research? This is a very important and sensitive question. I answer it in a couple ways. First, the Institutional Review Board uh, has very high standards for all clinical research, but particularly for people in special populations. Now we're talking about people who cannot give informed consent. And I'd say virtually all people with Down syndrome themselves do not pass the uh, threshold for being able to give informed consent. There are a series of pretty detailed questions that have to be asked. And it's generally beyond the intellectual capacity for the person to answer those. So there is a member of the family or other relatives, and this is defined by California statute in our state, who in the hierarchy can approve um, research consent. Now we do one other step. Before we do any procedure with um, someone uh, in down with Down syndrome participant, we ask, is it okay for us to draw the blood? Is it okay with you if we do the PET scan? Is it okay with you if we take an MRI scan or do the lumbar puncture? And unless they say yes, we don't do it. Now there's a, little conundrum here. People with Down syndrome are very stubborn. And sometimes they play with you. And the first thing they say is no. So uh, knowing when they mean no, and when they mean no, but yes, is, is comes from experience. And uh, our coordinator, Eric Duran, has become very good at deciphering this. The other thing I, I just want to mention, um, People with Down syndrome have a profound effect on their doctors, on the research personnel, on the lab technicians. There is a social intelligence in Down syndrome that goes way beyond the intellectual aspects of intelligence. And preserving this wonderful uh, social ability emotional intelligence is a big uh, goal for us. That's wonderful. Um, and, you know, Dr. Lott, it, talking about the profound impact that, that um, individuals with Down syndrome have on their physicians and the people who they work with, I'm just wondering and curious how you initially got into this field and working with people with Down syndrome and how you had the foresight to know that this is, uh, that people with Down syndrome are very important for the study of Alzheimer's disease research as well. Well, the first job I had after I finished my training at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital was to be the clinical director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center uh, for Intellectual Disabilities. 
Uh, this was a center located on the grounds of the Walter E. Fernald State School, first institution in the United States for people with intellectual disability. We had a research unit, and as part of that work, I became aware of this very important and interesting detective story about Down syndrome. And uh, it turned out to be a major focus of what we did. Just parenthetically, I also had the privilege of working with uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver when she uh, inaugurated the Special Olympics. And uh, people with Down syndrome were and are a major part of that. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, um, Dr. Lott. And thank you for taking the time to answer my questions and to speak to the Facebook community about this important, important topic. Um, and thank you very much to those of you who attended live today. And as Dr. Lott mentioned, um, the best way to learn about um, Down, uh, Down syndrome and Alzheimer's research at UCI is through our website, um, which is mind.uci.edu. You can go there to learn more about Dr. Lott's research in the UCI Mind Down syndrome program. Also at our website, you can find some information about a new quarterly educational support group for family caregivers of people with Down syndrome. The first session of 2020 um, is going to take place on January 21st at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Down Syndrome Association of Orange County in Costa Mesa. And it'll include a presentation from Eric Duran, who Dr. Lott mentioned and is his um, kind of right-hand man uh, for the UCI Mind Down Syndrome program. He um, manages the Down Syndrome program here and will be giving an educational presentation. This series is organized um, in collaboration by, with Alzheimer's Orange County and the Regional Center of Orange County as well. Um, lastly, I'm very excited to announce that we have an outstanding lineup of experts for our 2020 Facebook Live series. And our director UC, of UCI Mind, Dr. Joshua Grill, will kick off the first episode of 2020 on January 10th at our new time, 11 o'clock in the morning Pacific Standard Time. So please stay tuned, um, follow us on Facebook, join our email list um, for more details and have a wonderful holiday. We look forward to seeing you in the new year. Bye.